All right. So last week we did demons and fallen angels. And uh, I basically covered like uh, demonology and Brother Craig did a great study on understanding the fallen angels or the B'nai Elohim. And uh, the end of the study, Jack asked an amazing question. If the flood killed all the giants and destroyed everything and God basically hit the reset button, how did all the evil come back? So tonight we're going to be looking at a comprehensive study. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible, but we're going to look at how evil resurfaced itself in our world, right? Because it didn't take long. So with that being said, let's start at the end of the flood. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis 9. And there's some mysteries wrapped up in this. And we're going to read the portion of scripture and then we'll break it down after we read it. Andy, can you read uh, Genesis 9 verse 20 to 27? And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk, and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Kenan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Jebuth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine, and knew that what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. All right. So we see that. The flood took place. The ark landed. It's crazy. If you read the book of Jubilees in verse 20, it talks about the five-year period of planting crops and then reaping the fruit of it. So that one verse from 20 to 21 was a five-year period if you look at the calendar of Jubilees. But not to deviate off topic, Noah drank the wine, passed out drunk, and Ham, the middle son of Noah, did something. There's four formulas of thought that the Christian body says about this. The most popular one is that, you know, he saw his dad drunk and naked. And in ancient times, it was taboo to see somebody naked like that. And that's what the majority of the church holds to. Right. But our, and the other thoughts are that Ham castrated his father. There's another thought. And it, it gets graphic, guys. It says that Ham had sexual relations and defiled the father. And there's a fourth train of thought. We're going to look at each one of these real quick. And it's very important that we understand this. It says in Isaiah, if you understand the beginning, you'll understand the end. God writes the end in the beginning and the beginning in the end. So we're trying to understand the beginning, right? The fourth way of thought is that Ham had sex with the mother, okay? And tried to usurp authority and take Noah out. And that's why he took the robe, the garment, brought it to his brothers to show that he was the head. And his brothers fought him, took the robe back and gave it to Noah. Right. So this is one, uh, one train of thought. Let's look at uh, let's look at this. And um, so the one verse where in verse 21 or verse 20. My bad. 21, where it says 10, that word 10 in the Hebrew there's like a Hebrew vowel on the front of that word. And what that does is it makes it a masculine or a feminine. Because in ancient times, men had tents. And say you had a wife, your wife would have her own tent. She would be the mistress of your tribe, right? So in ancient Hebrew, they had a certain um, um, vowel that they would put in the front of the word tent to make it masculine or feminine. If you research this and that you guys can look this up in the Hebrew and like, um, uh, what, oh man, I can't even think. What are those Hebrew Bibles called, G? The ones we use all the time? The Hebrew. The, oh, the, the interlinear? Uh, yeah, the, the interlinear. interlinear. Yeah, 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 my yeah. bad. 
brain fart. So you yeah, can get yeah. a free interlinear app on your phone. That's what I got is free. And you can look this up, right? And it breaks down the Hebrew, each letter for you, verse by verse. So it's a feminine tent, right? That this dude Ham went into in verse 21. Okay. Now the word for nakedness, that Ham uncovered of his father, it's written two other times in the Bible. Let's look at those two other examples. Uh, let's go to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 17. And Dalton, could you read this one for us, bro? The Leviticus, what was it? Uh, chapter 20, verse 17. If a man, if a man marries his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and they have intercourse with each other, that is disgraceful. They shall be publicly cut off from the people. The man shall bear the penalty of having had intercourse with his own sister. Right. And so that word intercourse in the New King James is uh, written nakedness, and in the Hebrew, it's the same word that's used that we just read in Genesis 9, 21, that Ham did to his father, okay? And it's mentioned again in, uh, let's read one more, Leviticus 18, 7 through 8. You want to hit that one while you're at it, Dalton? You said 18, 7 through 8? Yeah, because it's the same exact word in the Hebrew there, too. It's mentioned these three times in the Old Testament. You shall not disgrace your father by having intercourse with your mother. She is your own mother. You shall not have intercourse with her. You shall not have intercourse with your father's wife, for that would be a disgrace to your father. Right, right. So in English, that word, like we have in some translations, nakedness, intercourse, it's the same word in the Hebrew. All these things are an abomination to God. God has given us a structure. God, man, woman, child. That's what God gave us from the beginning, and that's what's good, right? This is a perversion of that structure, just like that LGBTQ spirit that's on the face of the earth these days. It seeks to pervert God's structure, right? So that word, we see that same word mentioned there with Ham uncovering his father's nakedness. If you look carefully at that scripture we just read, notice Ham has three other children and Noah doesn't curse Ham. He doesn't curse any of his three children. All he curses is that fourth child. Why on earth would Noah only choose to curse the fourth child? That makes absolutely no sense unless what happened, and I present this, Noah got drunk, went to his wife's tent to lay with her, but he was so drunk he passed out naked. Ham comes in and does the dirty with his mom. Okay, I know it sounds disgusting. Okay, okay takes the robe, Noah's robe, presents it to the brothers saying, I now your sup authority as leader of our tribe. The brothers reject this, give Noah his robe back. That child that's born is Canaan and that's the cursed child that Noah cursed, the fourth child that was cursed by Noah. Now, this isn't the only time we see this. We're going to look at Nimrod, right? And we're going to break down because Nimrod did some crazy stuff, but Nimrod married his mother, dude. This guy popularized the idea of the queen of heaven. So where is he copying this cycle from? If Ham did it, the grandchild did it. Nimrod does the exact same thing, but it doesn't end there. If you look at 2 Samuel 16, verse 20 through 23, when King David's son overthrows him, right? Absolutely. He overthrows King David. He has sex with his sister, which we just read is an abomination to the Lord. And then he goes the extra mile. He steals his father's kingdom, usurping authority over the father. He takes all the wives of King David and has sex with them on the roof of the palace for the entire kingdom to see. So we see this reoccurring theme of darkness. We see this darkened theme to pervert God's family unit, to bring incest to the body, to popularize it and usurp authority from who God ordained to rebel and take power for themselves, right? Ham did it. Nimrod did it. Uh, David's son, uh, what's his name? Adonijah. Yeah, he did it. 
Okay, so so we see the the evil seed keeps doing these same tactics because Satan's a retard. He can't come up with nothing new. He keeps packaging the same trash over and over, right? So we see this idea, okay? And um, I want to just point out before we shift gears, make a mental notation of what Ham did here. I mean, ultimately, if you look at Noah, the mantle of authority over this, the head of this household was Noah. Noah probably shouldn't have been getting blacked out drunk and passing out naked. You know what I'm saying? That's not a very responsible thing to do when you're the head of your house, bro. We got to behave like men of God and use self-control because that's one of the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? Because if Noah wouldn't have done that, then none of this would have happened possibly, okay? So just keep that in mind. And I'm not saying that having a drink every now and then is a sin. That's a personal matter between you and God. But like, I mean, think about every time in your life that you've got rage and blacked out drunk. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you no good fruit came out of it. You know what I mean? Like, we got to seriously think about what we're doing here because there are consequences for our actions, bro. But let's shift gears here because we're focusing on how evil resurfaced. We see what Ham did. Okay, we see that Ham uncovered his father's nakedness, defiling the mother, cursing the child Canaan, the fourth, right? Let's fast forward to Genesis. Um, you know what? We're going to go to Genesis 10. But to understand the way I'm going to break this down, I know some of you guys know this and some of you guys probably don't. Let's look at the Genesis 5 mystery real quick. Because there's a rule of thumb here and we're going to apply it. The Genesis 5 mystery to Genesis 10. The Genesis 5 mystery, that dude Chuck Misler, a lot of you guys know who he is. He is a, he was an amazing teacher. He was the one who discovered this originally. He was like a Navy code breaker. And if you take Genesis chapter 5, the entire chapter, it's probably the most boring chapter in the Bible. It's just like Adam begot so-and-so. He lived this many days. He died. Seth be, lived this many days. He died, right? But check this out, guys. If you take each name mentioned in that genealogy and look up on your phone on Google, say, hey, Google, what does Adam mean in English? You take the Hebrew name and look it up in our English translation. I'm going to tell you what it spells out. OK, so Adam means man in English. His son's name is Seth. If you look Seth's name up, it means appointed, right? His son is Enosh. If you look his name up, it means mortal. OK, the next one is Canaan. If you look his name up, it's sorrow. Mahalalel, it means bless God. His son was Jared, which means shall come down. And then we have Enoch, the seventh, and his name means teacher. And Enoch, there's like a whole mystery there. Methuselah means death shall bring. And uh, Lamech means despairing. And Noah means rest or comfort. So when you put all those names together, their, their definition, this is what it spells out. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring despairing rest or comfort for all. Jesus Christ was prophesied in the names of Genesis 5. Okay. This is like divine. Like when people are like, oh, the Bible is just a bunch of fables. Bro, ain't no man smart enough to figure this out over a thousand years and, and purposely do that. This is it, proof of God's Holy Spirit inspiring this text. So what the reason I point this out to you, we are now going to take that principle of looking up the name and writing down what it means. And we're now going to apply it to Genesis 10 and the story of Nimrod. So let's read our main scripture and then we'll break it down uh, line upon line here. So let's go to Genesis 10. And then can we read? Um, there's a lot of really hard names here. When he starts getting into the cities, Chris, can you read verse uh, eight to about? Um, let's see. Let's go to. Let's just go like eight and ten, and then we'll look through the cities together. Cool. Um, and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherever it is said even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Eric and Asad and Kalna and the land of Shinar. Okay, and we're going to go through each one of these cities because there's a mystery wrapped up here, guys, when you look it up. But first, let's start with verse 8. 
because we understand what we just discussed about Ham Bone and his mom and that wicked evil seed and that cursed fourth child, right? We're following the lineage. And here we come to Nimrod, the grandchild. And in verse eight, his dad's name was Cush. If you look up what Cush means from Hebrew to English, his name means black death. Okay, it's death. If you look up the name Nimrod, it means we will rebel or great rebel. So the black death begot the rebel. Okay. And then check this out. This is crazy in verse eight. All right. The part where it says he began to be. Dude, I would highly suggest taking an interlinear. There are three words in Hebrew there. You guys got to look this stuff and study this on your own. For began, it's the Hebrew word shalel. It's H2490. The definition of this word is to bore or to pierce. The definition, because I didn't know what bore meant. It means to drill a hole, okay? So drill a hole or pierce. That's what the word is for began. To be is haya, which means um, to fall out, to come pa- to com- to pass, or to be, basically. And then the next one, a mighty one. This word is gibor. It's Strong's Exhaustive H1368. It has three words for the definition. Strong, mighty, or giant. Okay. Gabor is a trip. So basically, just I propose this idea to you. Nimrod somehow pierced himself either through dark sacrifice to demons or some sort of genetic mishap or both. There was some sort of piercing or boring that took place in Nimrod's soul where he was born a human being and made himself a gibberim. Okay. He became a mighty one. The word that's used there, Gibor, is the same exact word used in Genesis 6-4, which we discussed last week. Brother Craig did an awesome breakdown. It said when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they begot uh, the men of old, the men of renown, that word is Gibberim. It's the same word. Now, don't, not everywhere in the Bible does it have the connotation of giant because there was like, a, you know, King David and his mighty men. They were also called Gibberines because they were strong and mighty warriors, right? So there's like this line there. You have to discern this. The reason I'm saying the first two words is because like, dude, what the heck is to make a hole, to drill a hole or to pierce something, then becoming a mighty one? It's just crazy here. You know what I mean? So basically Nimrod did something to himself that made himself a man to basically like a demigod. He perverted himself in a, in a spiritual way or in a physical way. We don't know. It's a mystery, right? But he perverted himself to make himself a gibberim. Now we're going to look at, um, as we break down these cities, before we break down each one, because it's going to spell a story here in the, in the definition of each one. But I want to point out that Nimrod married his own mother, Semiramis, and they had a child named Tammuz. After we break down the cities, I'm going to show you in every single culture of human history and every time period, we have a regurgitated crap of Satan that does the same thing with that spirit of Nimrod, the divine feminine and their child. OK, it keeps happening all throughout mankind in our history. It, and so this all starts in the Bible with Nimrod. And that's why we're examining this. OK, so let's move on um, to verse um, so we're in chapter 10. We're going to look now at verse 10, 10, 10. All right. Like, well, verse nine, when it's talking about like a mighty hunter before the Lord, dude, you guys got to do a Hebrew study on this. Cause I don't want to say and say something that's wrong in the translation, but there's like a mystery there. If you really study it, um, he was a hunter. Some people think that he was a hunter of men like a cannibal type dude. We don't really know, right? You can look at this and study this in the Hebrew. But basically, it's like that spirit of Antichrist was released upon the face of the earth. That's what Nimrod really embodies, right? So the first city he built was called Babylon, right? Babylon, if you look this up, it means confusion or mixing, okay? The mixing or melting, just like, you know, 
when we when we have sin and we try to justify it instead of repenting of it, we're mixing. That's why he says in Second Corinthians, come out of her, my people, and be separate, right? Separate yourself from the spirit of Babylon. Separate yourself and God will receive you and you'll become his child through Christ. So we have Babylon means confusion or mixing. The second city he made is called Akkad. Akkad means subtle, okay? What, did I get that right? What's the third one? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I missed a wreck. A wreck means strengthening. And the third one is a cod, which means subtle. Now, the fourth city, this is where it's starting to open up for me where I start getting this. This is called Kalne. If you Google what does Kalne mean, it says fortress of Anu. And it spells Anu, A-N-U. Have you all ever heard of that phrase, Anunnaki? It's like big in our society nowadays, right? Well, this boils all the way back to the Sumerian and the Akkadians. And I'm going to get into a quick little like demonology breakdown in a minute. That dude, that spirit, that demonic spirit, Anu, opened the door for five other strong demons that come flooding into the face of the earth. And those five demons is where we get um, Inki, Haya, Baba, and Uta. Now, when you break down human civilization from each way back and you follow our history, all of our demons that we have on the face of the earth all come from these five. And those five came in through that one. So, see, I want to paint this picture. God flooded the earth. He wiped the earth clean from this trash. He basically hit the reset button, right? But that whole thing happened with Ham and that cursed fourth child, which gave way to Nimrod, making himself from a man to a gibberim. And now Nimrod is telling you in the names of his cities that he's opening the door of these demons. So we see these demonic spirits re-entering our earth again after the flood, right? And everything that takes place in the spirit must take place in the natural, right? It just takes thousands of years. But these same spirits keep manifesting themselves over and over because Satan just does the same stuff over and over. He has no creativity whatsoever. Okay, but let's continue with the cities. So Calne is fortress of Anu. Ninus is the city of Nimrod. Rehoboth ear means wide path or streets. Kala means complete and reason is a bridle. When you put this all together backwards, it says, this is basically in a nutshell what it says. Through confusion or mixing of God's ways into the new ways of a new God called a new, which spawned wide paths through the creation of God's that will follow okay so nimrod's telling you in the names of his city what he's doing um those gods again the, so we have a new was the first that's the main chief principality or power then he opened the door for inki haya baba and uta these are akkadian gods and sumerian gods now it's funny you guys ever remember that show i love lucy when you were a kid remember ricky ricardo would always sing that song he'd go baba lu that's the demon, Baba. That's the same spirit. It's been on this earth for thousands of years, right? Those Puerto Rican gods, that's one of them, dude. It's like the same demon. There's nothing new under the sun, like the Bible says, right? But Hollywood, like, I, makes people idolize this kind of stuff. Now, I don't really want to get into the Tower of Babel because that's a whole nother loaded thing, dude. Some people say Nimrod made the Tower of Babel. Some people say that Nimrod just simply dug it up. Because it was there before the flood, right? There's like the breakdown in the word, babe and L, L meaning God, babe meaning an ancient doorway, meaning that they tried to kill God. The Tower of Babel was basically a huge spiritual doorway, but I'm going to leave it there and I'm not going to say anything else about that because there's like a whole, whole thing about Babel. So basically we have this guy Nimrod, he changes himself, he makes all these cities in the land of Shinar, and then the guy... At the when the judgment of Babel falls, he disappears like a fart in the wind. Now he's gone until Genesis 14. Now, here's the mystery, guys. This is what I want you guys to look at. We're in Genesis 14, and I want you guys to study this in your own time and read this chapter. Okay. The king of Sodom is attacked by these uh seven giant kings, they're gibbering kings, and one of them's name is Am Raphael. Okay, 
This is Nimrod. He changed his name because Amraphel was the king of Babylon and the creator of Shinar. Who did we just read in Genesis 10.10 10, who created Babylon and Shinar? Nimrod. Okay. He had to change his name after Babel to Am Amraphel, which if you look it up, this is a trip. It means sayer of darkness or um, king of Shinar or fall of sayer. Okay. So a lot of you guys know in witchcraft, like with incantation, you it, remember we did a whole study on proclamation, how we're supposed to speak life and not death. In witchcraft, they speak death. They speak that word incantation. But us, as followers of Jesus Christ, we speak life and we break the power of darkness, right? Because God's power is greater. We're called to speak life and everything. It's ironic that Nimrod changed his name from the rebel to the sayer of darkness, Okay. He started to integrate uh, witchcraft into, into his name. So if you read Genesis 14, it's like a whole thing. He basically steals Lot, Abraham's cousin, and Abraham and Melchizedek, which some believe is Christ, right? Destroyed these seven giant kings. It's the first time where Abraham in scripture finally stops being a coward and a liar and he stands up in boldness, and he destroys the giants. Amraphel was one of those giants. Yeah. Nimrod was defeated right there. Okay? So when we break it down to the Akkadian, Nimrod, it's the word for Nimrod in Akkadian is Armutuk. Our English translation would be Marduk. I don't know about you guys. I was into death metal really bad before I was a Christian, and there's this death metal band called Marduk. And I used to think it was real cool. I had no idea I was invoking a demon the entire time I was listening to this metal band. They're named after Nimrod, like this ancient uh, giant, you know. Uh, in Egyptian mythology, Nimrod was also known as Osiris. Uh, in Canaan culture, he became the sun god of fire, okay? Uh, Moloch. Whenever you read Moloch, that's how the Canaanites believe Nimrod to be, the sun god of fire. And we know that they sacrificed their babies to Moloch, right? So that demonic spirit, even after Nimrod's body died, that demonic spirit continues on, on the earth, off blood, off sacrifice, off darkness, off wickedness. All the things contrary to God empower this garbage, okay? In Grecian culture, he was called Apollo, okay? And the one I'm most familiar with, because that was the witchcraft that I was wrapped up in, is Norse culture. I was big into Asatuism and Odinism. And in Norse culture, we called him Odin. This is Nimrod. Same, same thing. The Bible says there is nothing new under the sun, and there isn't. Okay? Only God creates. Satan cannot create. He just does the same things over and over and over hoping for a different result, but it's just his judgment is sealed, dude. It's like Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It's done. Okay. Now Nimrod's mom. Okay. This is the divine feminine, the queen of heaven. Her name was Semiramis in the beginning. In Akkadian culture, they called her Lydia, known as the wife of Nimrod. Yeah. In Egyptian culture, she was called Ishtar or Isis. There's like a big debate on that, but either one, basically. In Canaan culture, she was called Ashtaroth, okay, Ishtar. That's where we get that word Easter from that has to do with the fertility and the eggs, right? In Grecian culture, she was called Gaia or uh, Aromides. And I think Gaia is interesting because there's that spirit right now, that new age spirit. They're like, save the earth, Gaia, all this stuff. It's that same queen of heaven spirit repackaged. And in Norse mythology, she was known as Freya. And I remember when I used to practice that form of witchcraft, whenever we would do incantation for Freya, it always had this weird, uh, like, I, all right, this is like really weird. And I know it's going to sound nuts, but we used to do this one spell where we could speak over different types of flowers and plants, and they would literally come alive. And as we would rhyme our words in the incantation, these plants and flowers and things would have faces and become alive and dance, right? When we would do that type of spell, we were incanting to Freya. That's the queen of heaven. That's Semiramis. There's nothing new under the sun. I was totally ignorant, right? I didn't even know of the power of God when I was involved in this stuff, man. But this is real, man. 
Um, so Freya's Norse culture, now they had a son, Tammuz, and it's like the uh the de- not divine feminine's child. You see this a lot in like and don't get me wrong with the Catholicism, okay? I know a lot of Catholics that do love God and do read their Bible, okay? But there's a lot wrong with Catholicism in when they pray to Mary or when they pray to saints. Because John 14, 6 says the only way to the Father is through the Son, right? That spirit of praying to Mary, and you see this a lot in like uh, the Catholic Church where it has a portrait of Mary and she's holding a child. And some people say it's baby Jesus. It's actually Tammuz, the spirit of Tammuz. In Akkadian, he was known as Duzu. In Egyptian, he was known as Bacchus. Okay. In in Canaan uh, culture, he was known as Damzud. In Grecian culture, uh, which this actually appears in scripture, guys. um, His name was Adonoi. And you can actually find the scripture about that in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. Israel had falled, and they was praying to Adonoi, who was actually Tammuz. In Norse mythology, he's known as Thor, okay? So there's our three parts. We have Nimrod, the divine feminine, and we have the child. All of this was copied from him, and I bring and present all these things tonight, saying God did wipe the earth. God destroyed the wickedness from the face of the earth. And because of all this sin that happened immediately after the flood through Ham, having sex with his mother, giving birth to the Black Death, who begot Nimrod, who changed his DNA or did a dark sacrifice, making himself a gibberim, he literally called his fourth city the Fortress of Anu, telling you, now there's a principality and power, a demon spirit on the face of the earth named Anu, who then opened the door for all these other strong men demons And now here we are thousands of years later, and we wage war, guys, in the spirit. We do not war against flesh and blood. This is a truly spiritual battle that we fight. And when we pray about this kind of stuff and God gives us wisdom and knowledge, we can target how to pray effectively against these different types of things. So with all that being said, what you guys got stuff on this? G, I know you got something, bro. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, not to go too deep in the uh, Tower of Babel stuff, but one interesting thing that you mentioned was uh, if Nimrod had possibly found it, which is a theory, rather than building it. And one of the entities there was Enki, or Enkidu. Mm-hmm. And that spirit... Um, goes back to Sumer, back to Gilgamesh, all this stuff. And Anu, because as we hear, we've been hearing forever, a new world order, it's a play on words. It's Anu world order. So that's the spirit behind it. It's one of the first demonic creator, fake creator gods that they had, which was Anu. And that's what this whole Anu world order is about. Uh, The Sumerian gods are mentioned in the word of God uh, well after the flood. In Numbers chapter 13 and in other places, we see that the uh, Israelites, as they were going through the conquest of uh, Joshua's conquest, when they were getting the promised land, they had run into uh, the sons of Anak who were Mm -hmm. extremely tall. They were the ones that were seen as grasshoppers in the sons of Anak's eyes, and they were afraid Mm -hmm. of them. And God told them, don't be afraid of them. I will deliver them into your hands. And this is when the scouts also brought back grapes, clusters of grapes and pomegranates and all these other different fruits that it literally took like six guys to carry a, a bundle of grapes. So everything was huge. They were even harvesting and farming gigantic um, fruits and stuff like that to sustain themselves. And the cannibalistic aspect of it, I do believe Nimrod absolutely was probably eating people because the Nephilim did that. And if he turned himself into one, which he most certainly did, he was eating people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another interesting thing I'd like to note, I know Matthew's not a big fan of the book of Jasher, and I see why he's not. There are good copies and bad copies of it. But 
all in all, I do endorse it. I have a good copy of it. And it gives a lot of extra stuff that happens that goes on. I bet you guys don't know who actually killed Nimrod. It was Esau, according to the Book of Jasher. When Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup, it was because he had just killed Nimrod and he thought he was about to die because he was being hunted by Nimrod's forces. So that's why he sold his uh, birthright to his brother. And, you know, stuff like that is good to know, but you do need to know the word of God. These 66 books are what is needed to have a healthy discipleship and walk with Christ. All the other stuff is good to know. And it fills in a lot of gaps because there's only so much that, that can be put here. And when institutions like the Catholic Church were birthed, they hid this stuff. They didn't want people to know this information. That's why the Book of Enoch got decanonized and all, all kinds of things like that. There was one other interesting name that was mentioned in the breakdown, and that was Haya, which yes. is a name of a Nephilim that is in the Book of Giants, which is another uh, lost book from the Nephilim's perspective, because mm -hmm. they actually had dreams of their end. Many of them were having dreams, nightmares, really, because God was showing them their demise. And the book is fragmented. I have a copy of it, and it's a very interesting read because you get really into it, and then there's a whole paragraph missing, which sucks, but that's the way it is. And Haya was one of those names. That's, you know, so these entities have been around forever. They're disembodied now. And uh, I do believe that with uh, cloning and, and stuff that they're doing today, um, they're able to inhabit a meat suit and uh, enjoy the physical realm again without having to jump into a person. But that's a whole other talk. Well, hey, let me say something to that, though. Sure. All right. So all these things about Nimrod, you know, and Ham fornicating with the mother, them demonic spirits normalize that in our society today. All right. Because yeah. we're all guys here straight up. Like, you know, there's guys that struggle with porn addictions and they look at like that kind of MILF stuff. That's demonic. Mm. It's disgusting. It's an abomination to the Lord. But what those spirits are doing is seeking to normalize that type yeah. of behavior. It's the same behavior Ham demonstrated. It's the same behavior Nimrod demonstrated. It's the same behavior Absalom demonstrated over David. And there, our society is like normalizing this garbage and it's abomination to the God, to the, our Lord. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like those demonic spirits. And you, there's other ways too. They, they repackage this stuff and try to get men to sin in this stuff, you know? And notice Absalom was, he, he got killed. He died yeah. because of that. He was killed. Yep. Because of that. And David mourned him. Huh. He mourned that wicked son of his. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy, man. The wage of yeah. sin is death. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Amen. Does anybody got anything else on this subject tonight? I gonna, yeah, I was going to ask. It's slightly off topic, but kind of relevant. So I've yeah. been reading the book of Acts lately. Um, I al always, when I went to Catholic school, I was told like, oh yeah, the Catholic church started when Jesus says, Peter, you are my rock. And then it started. Nonsense. And yeah, so I hear this all the time, but I wanted to know like, when did the Acts, because I know it was Catholic and Orthodox together initially. And then they split in about 400 AD. But do you know hundreds? Yeah, do you know when that original church was like technically late, started? Late the late 300s. Really? Late, yeah, after the Council of Nicaea. Yeah, I don't know about the time, but I know that the reason was the papacy. The Catholics wanted to continue to put a pope over them, and the Orthodox yeah. said Jesus is our pope, basically. Yeah. So that's what caused the riff, you know? Yeah, and uh, they had a slight difference in their belief in the trinity i forget yeah i forget the exact difference but they have like a little minor difference it's called mm -hmm. the Holy. and uh, yeah, that's, that's good you're reading acts though bro that's important yeah. to learn like though like dude there's when you're done with acts and you get that word deep in you there's a book i would recommend also called fox's book of martyrs and fox's book of martyrs the whole book is a little boring in itself, but the first like 20 chapters is written from that Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus. And what he does is he gives an account of what happened to the 12 apostles after the book of Acts. Yep. 
and oh, it's wow. crazy, man. Yeah, like Matthew was filleted alive and yeah, on a mission I trip and deaths in middle school. That's, that's dude, weird. there's one when they're talking about John, the dude that wrote John, First John, Second John, Third John, and Revelation. Um, they threw him in a boiling pot of oil to kill him, and somehow God protected him, and the oil didn't touch his skin. So Nero was like freaked out by it and everybody was freaked Horrible. out that's You're why right. they put him on yeah. patmos where he wrote yeah. the book of revelation oh it's in fox's they book couldn't of kill him. they tried to wow. kill him so many times they couldn't do it yeah <laughs> it's interesting wow, it's, it's important to learn that stuff though bro Bartholomew, yeah. they stack stones up on top of him and so his organs like got crushed yeah it's crazy oh, it's crazy stuff does uh does anybody else have any questions on tonight's study with the Nimrod thing or the evil reentering? Yeah, I found something. I just want you to take a look at it real quick. If I could, I found this like uh, I don't really know much about it, but it looks like pretty crazy. So I guess Ooh. you allow me to share my screen. Is that possible? Yeah, yeah. Let me turn the just one second here. Uh, all right, should be good to go, Jack. All right, let me pull it up. Yeah, I don't know too much about it, but it looked kind of like kind of intense. So I would figure I think it like pretty much relates to what we're talking about here. Sweet. Uh, all right, so it's like this whole thing that's like that's oh the, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I've seen this before. Yeah. That's the, yeah. Oh, I have that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I just I, yeah, I guess and the Kabbalah. That's what I was trying to think. They're the ones. Yeah, that is Kabbalah. That's the tree of life that they call. And then, so they made that or what? Like That's all, Jewish Babylonianism. Life. It came later, but yeah, it comes from, from Nimrod originally. And that's yes. the symbol, but what somebody's done is gone back and tried to show the conspiracy on the tree of life of the Kabbalah tree of life. So basically somebody's just taken that, you know, occult symbol, which is the Kabbalah tree of life. And then mm -hmm. they just superimposed conspiratorial, you know, kind of a network on there, so to speak, you know, it's a pretty you know what, Jack? lesson. That's a really, it's really, you know, it's crazy too. And that's how much garbage has flowed in over these thousands of years from these doors being open spiritually. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that one door burst it open. And now look where we are all these years later. This is all the garbage that is like the fruit of that. It's yeah, crazy. That's, yeah, that's the fruit of that tree, that Kabbalah yeah. tree. Yeah. And it's, you see the Nimrod, at the, the Canaanites with Nimrod at the top, and then you were yeah. talking about Osiris yeah. before. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, that's the fruit of the industry. Bow worship. Yeah. Drunk. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. yeah, it's just crazy how that like kind of said, because I've watched other stuff too that the Nimrod really like started a lot of this stuff. He was the first Antichrist man. He was mm -hmm. the first. I'm telling you guys, look up those three Hebrew words in Genesis 10 8 for um if, if you can get a an interlinear, it's free uh at the app store. Look up in verse eight, began to be a mighty one. Because it's not just mighty one like King David and his men, like Nimrod literally changed his soul yeah. in the word for began, shalel. And it's like a dark incantation that made him a gibberim. So whatever. And you know, it, 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 it oh man, it, it just goes deep. You know what I mean? And this is like the goal of witchcraft. This Ooh. is the goal of all dark arts, man, is to change that person and morph them just like Nimrod did. Yeah, yeah. that's got Marduk on the right, too. You know, it's got all those people <laughs> we've been talking about tonight. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, one thing I wanted to add, I forgot to talking about um, when Matthew was going over all the names of Nimrod, how all these different civilizations have these different names, but it's the same unholy trinity when you look at it, whether it's the Greeks, the it doesn't matter who it is, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Norse, the, it's the same unholy trinity. And that is proof that God came down because language was all one language in the beginning. And he confounded the language. He confounded confusion because Babel is confusion. And all the languages, people couldn't understand each other after the Tower of Babel. So that is actual proof that he has all these different names. Semiramis has all these different names. Baal has all these different names because of that. 
Yo, that lines up with what Brother Craig was teaching last week, too, about, remember, he was talking about the 70 nations and the yeah. 70 watchers and all that? It all lines up, bro. Yeah. Everything lines up. The word yeah. the word cannot be broken. It's perfect, you know? Absolutely. Amen. Well, praise God. Does anybody else got any questions, comments, anything you want to bring up tonight? Amen. Man. Let's let's uh close it out tonight. Andy, you want to pray us out, bro? All right. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this night that we could gather together as men and just pray that you would uh help us to understand these things better and and get a better understanding of how evil came back into our world and continues throughout our nation and in the world itself. And just pray that you'd uh Help us be on our guard and uh, study your word more and just keep that as our, our forethought and ready to go with us uh, throughout this week and everyone that we come across and meet and that uh, your glory and love would show through us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Have a blessed week, guys. All right, fellas. See you next <laughs> week. Later.